Hello, I'm Lucian Taylor, and uh, it looks like we're here alone, just you and me. Uh, oh no, wait, nope, there's a lot of people just like you and me. We're all very diverse. Uh, we all look different, we think differently on a lot of things, but there's something that actually binds us all together, a humanity that keeps us in need of each other. And that's not a bad thing. That's not an unhealthy thing. It's actually the healthiest of all possible things as human beings. That's actually what we're going to talk about in the next several weeks. Each of us is self-sustaining as an individual, but only to a degree. As happy as we all look standing on our own, we actually need each other in ways that we may not realize. Kind of like the example of these three boys, for example, these little brothers. Um, why are they so happy? To me, they look like they're happy because they've got each other. Uh, the one's got his arm around the other two. Um, there's something about community and being in relationship that can actually bring happiness um, and lead to a fulfilling life. And that's what we're going to talk about. And it's this concept that relationship is essential. So we'll do this over at least three weeks, maybe extending beyond that. But let me talk to you about what we'll be discussing across these three weeks. Today, in week one, we're going to talk about why relationship is essential to being. That is, to even just simply existing as humans. Um, like a seed that needs soil. Next week, we'll talk about why relationship is essential to becoming or to growing. Like a sapling that needs nutrients to thrive and grow stronger. And then in week three, we'll talk about why relationship is essential to belonging, to bearing fruit, like a tree that provides home in its branches and rest in its shade. So that's where we'll be going. But let me uh, share a word with you before we begin. Uh, in this series, we will be talking about relationships. And that means that people who hate talking about relationships probably aren't watching this unless they got dragged here by somebody who loves talking about relationships. You know who you're talking about. Um, and people who love talking about relationships probably are watching this, and they may be hoping to receive lots of relationship tips. But to both groups, my deepest apologies right off the bat, because if you hate talking about relationships, I'm gonna talk about relationships. And if you love talking about relationships, I'm not offering those relationship tips until week three. Why? Because instead, I'm first going to talk about something super important, why relationships matter. Specifically, why relationships matter so much that they are essential to life, essential to living a healthy life, and sometimes essential to staying alive at all. So let's start out with week one. Today, we're going to focus on one aspect of relationships, which is being. Relationship is essential to being. Really, just to existing, to being human. And we'll cover three topics today. First one is why transactions are not relationships. The second one is why humans are relational beings. And the third is why living transactionally is lethal. So first... Transactions are not relationships. Here's something that all marketers know, and I used to kind of be a marketer. I was an executive in product management, so I worked with a lot of marketers. And what all marketers know is that people tend to interact in two ways. First, they interact transactionally, and second, they interact relationally. And what all pastors know uh, about people in churches is that people in, in tend to interact at church in those same two ways, transactionally and relationally. Uh, so what do these things mean? Uh, transaction, uh, Webster's defines very simply as an exchange or a transfer of goods, services, or funds. This is pretty easy to understand. It's just basically I give you something, you give me something, I offer you something, you offer me something in return. Simple exchange. But a relationship is a more complex animal. A relationship, Webster says, is the aspect or quality, such as resemblance, 
that connects or binds participants as being or belonging or working together or a being of the same kind. Boy, that sounds just messy, doesn't it? Complicated. Wow, well, what is it exactly you want? What? Yeah. So transactions are simple, easy, and less threatening, which is why we like them. And our whole economy is based on them. And relationships, on the other hand, are complex, hard, and more threatening, which is why we tend to avoid them. But relationships are far more valuable than transactions, which is why we want them. Human beings, human nature. What are you going to say? This even happens at church. There can be transactions at church. Have you ever thought about this? When I attend a service, I give my attendance, my confession, and my offering. And in return, I expect something. I expect my teaching, my absolution, and my Eucharist, or my communion. So this is a simple exchange, but it's not really everything we need. Uh, it's not a really good way of thinking about church, actually. Transactions, though, uh, do have certain capabilities. Transactional interactions can deliver a benefit for a payment. Uh, they can deliver an experience for a time investment. They can deliver an answer to a question. They can deliver relief for a concern. But what transactional interactions cannot do is they cannot cure loneliness. Because in a transaction, I'm not essentially needed. I'm just a number. I'm just a customer. Transactional interactions cannot create well-being because I'm not fully known and yet fully accepted. I'm just a number. And transactional interactions cannot create belonging because I'm not an essential part of a larger whole. You know, in church, if all we needed were transactional experiences, we could simplify our whole church experience. There wouldn't be any need to gather in person. We could save commuting time. There wouldn't be any need for church buildings. We could save money, just stay home. And we could just have convenient services on YouTube and worship whenever we want. Wait a minute, we're kind of doing all three of those things. Yeah, this coronavirus thing, it's really kind of changed our lifestyle, hasn't it? We don't gather in person anymore. We can't really use our church buildings. And we're watching worship on YouTube. Well, you know, that's about all we can do right now. And so I'm thankful for it, and probably you are too. But it's really not quite the same thing, is it, as being in person, as seeing people, as interacting with people, as being in a worship space. There's something about qualitative interaction that is richer and deeper than this reduction to transactions. I mean, if we wanted to continue this transactional idea, maybe we could just start getting Eucharist delivered by Amazon and take communion any time. Or maybe we just ask Siri to pray for us, uh, any topic, any time, you know, super convenient but not really rich, right? And not really rewarding, something missing. Transactions cannot satisfy all of our core needs because humans are not transactional machines. Humans are relational beings. That's the key point. Humans are relational beings. Well, what makes us relational beings? We are created by God in the image of God. The nature of our being is patterned after the nature of God's being. So if God is relational, then we are relational because we are made in God's image. So what is God's image exactly? Well, we don't know exactly because none of us have ever seen God, but we do know essentially that God is a relational being. God is one being in three persons, a trinity of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. The essence of God is relational. No one can picture this perfectly, but lots of artists have tried. This is an Old Testament trinity icon by Andrei Rublia from 1400, and it pictures three persons of the trinity sitting around a table. A later uh, version of this is in this painting um, by Henrik von Balen in 1620, in which now we see the persons are distinguished a bit. We see the Father, God the Father on the right, Jesus the Son on the left, and the Holy Spirit pictured as a dove. So the persons are distinct. And then this 
even later image shows a picture of the Trinity uh, in this fresco by Luca Rossetti. And uh, I like this one because you not only distinguish between the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, but they, they're not just sitting there doing nothing. The Father is saying something to the Son, the Son is considering it and interacting, the Holy Spirit is engaged in the conversation. See, the whole point of God being a relational being of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit is there's a continuous conversation going on within God's own being. And so if God is made this way, if God is this way, not made, but is this way, then we who are made by God have to be somehow similar in essence to this. So what is our image? In Genesis 1.26, uh, the scripture says, then God said, let us, that is the three persons of the Trinity, let us make humankind in our image according to our likeness. So God intends to make human beings in somehow this relational way. Um, there's no perfect picture of this either, though this is the famous uh, creation of Adam painting in the Sistine Chapel by Michelangelo. But on the right there, you see God the Father with the heavenly uh, angels surrounding him in community. And he's making Adam, making um, the first human being. But it doesn't end there. Because in the very next verse of Genesis, Genesis 1.27, uh, it says, So God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them, a plural. He created them male and female. So this image of the creation of mankind by Michael o, Michelangelo, also in the Sistine Chapel, looks a little different, doesn't it? Now there are three people in the picture. There's God, there's Adam, and there's Eve. And it reminds me a little bit of this picture that we looked at earlier. In other words, the picture of the Holy Trinity is similar to the picture of interrelationship that goes on between Adam and Eve, between Adam and God, between Eve and God, uh, between the three of them. There's a relationship that is inherent to being created as a human being in God's image. We are relational. So why did God create a second human being? Why wasn't one human being enough? In the Garden of Eden, the creation of Adam and Eve occurred before sin ever entered the world. So creating a second human being wasn't to correct a problem of sin because sin hadn't yet entered the world. God created Eve because God knew it was essential to Adam's life that Adam live his life in relationship with another co-equal person. How do we know that, though? How do we know what God was thinking when he created Eve? Well, Genesis actually tells us what God was thinking as his creation process uh, continued. In Genesis 1, God evaluated his own creation five times. First one is, after God made the heavens and the earth, Scripture says, and God saw that it was good. Secondly, after God made the plants and the trees, and God saw that it was good. Third, after God made the sun, moon, and stars, and God saw that it was good. Fourth, after God made the sea animals and birds, and God saw that it was good. And fifth, after God made the land animals, and God saw that it was good. Everything God creates is good. His whole creation is good. And yet, before sin ever enters the world, while everything is still good and perfect, suddenly God saw something in his sinless perfect creation that was not good. After God made Adam, Genesis 2.18, it is not good that the man should be alone. By the way, these are the words of the Lord God. It is not good that the man should be alone. God knows that we should not be alone. Adam's aloneness was a critical problem with God's new creation, which itself was perfect and flawless. Adam was created, you see, to be in relationship as God is in relationship, not to be alone. So God brought all the animals, animals to Adam to see if any of them would be a cure for Adam's aloneness. Um, but Adam needed an equal. 
a person so similar to him that she had to be made for him. So God immediately created the one remedy for Adam's aloneness, which is a second human being. Genesis 2.18, I will make him, these are the words of God, I will make him a helper as his partner. Making Eve was God's final culminating act of creation. And after God made Eve, then Genesis tells us that God saw everything he had made, and indeed, it was not only good, it was very good. In other words, the creation of Eve after Adam was the completion of God's intention for the creation of humanity, that there be human beings uh, created to be in relationship. God, who's our creator, knows that we have an ex existential need to be in relationship in order to be whole. That's not a statement of weakness. That's not a statement of being faulty or codependent. It's a statement of our identity and our nature as human beings that we need to be in relationship. Relationship is essential both for God, who exists as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and for the human beings he creates in his image. So, given how clearly God created us to be in relationship with both God and with each other, what's wrong with this picture? Oh, this looks familiar. This is the uh, icon of America, the lone cowboy. This is our hero, the man who stands apart, stands alone, my life story, it's all about me. Uh, let me ask you a question. Does this guy look happy? Would you, would you describe this face as sort of similar to the faces we saw earlier, those happy faces? Not so happy, is he? Looks kind of lonely. He's also got a bad sunburn, which doesn't help. Um, but this is really not the picture of fulfillment and happiness, being alone. Uh, what about this guy, uh, this man? Oh yeah, the Marlboro Man, we know, we know this image very well. Um, yeah, iconic image, looks kind of strong, but does he look very relational? Does he look like he's about to open up and tell you what's really going on inside him? Um, yeah, he looks kind of aloof and probably a little stunted emotionally. In fact, I think he might be the other guy's twin brother. The question really is, are these the self-images that God has in mind for us? Did God create us to be like this lone cowboy or like this standoffish Marlboro man? Or did God intend something different for us? Maybe a, a life like this that little kids even know how to live. A, a life in which we are together, in which we are playmates and friends. We know each other, we have fun together, we discover things together, we go through life together, we explore together. I mean, look at the sheer delight uh, of the simplicity of whatever they're looking at in that little jar. Um, it's the silly things, the small things, the things that are really about human relationship that bring us happiness in life. Something like that, or something like this, like this picture of these three boys um, that I showed you at the beginning there their camaraderie. Or maybe something like this, like uh, the image of uh, a wedding, uh, where the bride and groom want to share their happiness with those around them, the members of the clergy or their friends and their family. Um, I know that this couple was happy because I was a part of this couple. This is my wedding, and uh, it was pretty happy. Um, and that's really more the image of what God has in mind for us. So what does the Genesis narrative really tell us? It tells us that human relationship is ontological. There's a big fancy five-syllable word you can show off to your friends. All that ontological means is that it means it's essential to our being. Relationship is essential to our being as humans. It's not just an option for our doing. Um, and this is where we often get confused. Because modern people often think that doing is more important than being. And that is a big mistake. There's a tool that you can get on the web at, through Google, the Google Books Ngram Viewer, and this is a tool that examines the word usage of individual words for long periods of time over a couple of centuries. Um, and so I used this um, to look at the relative change in word usage in the U.S. from 1800 to 2010 for four different words. 
Ex uh, a word usage that's increasing it tends to indicate that the concept of that word is actually more important because people are using that word more often. If a word is decreasing in usage, it tends to mean that that concept or that word um, is less important, that we don't value it as much. So you can almost use this as a measure of value. So I looked at four words, which were be and being and do and doing. And here's what I saw. From 1800 to 2010, the usage or the value of be and being went down. And what's it replaced by? It's replaced by the increased value of do and doing. Um, as being declines in value, doing increases in value or in importance. And you can especially see this since 1965, especially if you look at the doing examples there, where suddenly we are doing, 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 doing more and more and more. Um, and we I know why this is. I think it's modern society. It's, it's when the computer revolution really took place uh, shortly after this personal computers came on the scene, then email, then the internet, and then everything else after that. <coughs> and we are now consumed by doing. And what we're ignoring is being. But that's a problem because humans are relational beings not relational doings. So if living relationally in relationship is essential to the health of our being, what does that tell us about living transactionally? It tells us that living transactionally is lethal. Lethal. Of relating to or causing death, capable of causing death, or gravely damaging, destructive, or devastating. Living transactionally is dangerous. Uh, so what is this not good that happens when human beings live transactionally, when human beings do not live in relationship? Well, it's a whole chain of events that starts with a transaction and proceeds in not a very good direction. First, when you live transactionally, sin happens. And here's an example. Eve, in the Garden of Eden, was successfully tempted by the serpent to eat the apple. Uh, why? Why was she tempted? Because Adam, who was, guess what, was standing right next to her, did nothing. Why not? Why wouldn't he have intervened? Because he had chosen to live his life transactionally rather than relationally. A relationship involves self-sacrifice, but Adam was self-serving. He let Eve go destroy herself. He just stood there and did nothing. Adam had removed himself from relationship with Eve, even though he was standing right next to her. He was not bonded to her. He let her walk off into danger. And so what was the result of Adam's selfish choice? Eve then fell into the serpent's temptation, and then she sinned. So then what? Then what did Eve do? Eve chose to live transactionally, just like Adam had done. How's that? Because rather than protect Adam, once she knew that the fruit was deadly, she turned and offered him the deadly fruit. Eve had removed herself from her relationship with Adam. And what was the result of Eve's selfish choice? Adam then fell into the serpent's temptation and he sinned. So the first thing that happens is sin. The second thing that happens as a consequence of sin is suffering. What was the result of Adam and Eve's sin? Well, they were thrown out of the Garden of Eden, and really the result that goes all the way down to us is an endless cycle of human suffering. The cycle of suffering is characterized by two things, separation from God and separation from one another. Separation is suffering whether it's from God or from each other. And the cycle begins with selfishness. And sad to say, if it, takes, if it goes on long enough, it ends with death. How does that work? Well, here's how it works. It's not a great picture, but here's how it works. Selfishness, if we persist in it, leads to woundedness. As we selfishly hurt other people, they also turn around and hurt us and we become wounded. Our woundedness then leads us to anger. 
we get hurt, you get angry. In our hurt, we become angry at other people. Then what? Then the anger leads to more sin. We're going to take it out on somebody. We're going to get even. In our hurt and our anger, we lash out at other people. Well, then what? We, the victims of abuse, because we've been sinned against, then turn around and lash out and we become the abusers. It's the last thing we want to be. More sin then leads to more separation. Because to protect ourselves from more abuse, we remove ourselves further from other people. And then this continues. As we separate ourselves more and more, more separation leads, not surprisingly, to loneliness. As we remove ourselves from others, we feel emotional starvation. We feel that even now in this coronavirus epidemic as we're unable to be with each other. We begin to feel hungry for something we can't quite name and nothing really around the house quite satisfies. It's that bond with the people that we want. It's that um, relationship that we're missing. So more separation leads to loneliness. Deuteronomy uh, supports this. It says, one does not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of the Lord. Um, words can actually be life-giving, as can the presence of someone else. Then what? The loneliness that we feel then leads to one or another form of addiction. We need something to comfort us and sustain us. Emotionally starved people turn to false forms of nourishment. These could be a lot of different things, drugs, alcohol, sex, money, position, power. Uh, there's a lot of different places to turn. But what these things have in common is they enslave us. Addictions lead to enslavement. Um, how does that work? Well, convinced that we need what are really false gods, we become slaves to them. We serve our false gods despite their inability to save us. And that enslavement then leads to spiritual blindness. We become unable to see that we're actually enslaved and that we're actually addicted. Worshiping idols blinds us to seeing the true God. This is what Romans 1 says, by the way. Then that spiritual blindness leads us to hopelessness. Matthew 6.23 says, If your eye is unhealthy, your whole body will be full of darkness. If then the light in you is darkness, how great is the darkness? So we become darkened by sin and addiction and slave, enslavement to these false gods. And then in our blindness, we lose hope because we can't see. And finally, if this goes on long enough, death happens. Hopelessness hopelessness leads to death. We come to feel imprisoned in a place of no escape. Any suicide counselor knows that this is true. Uh, this is why hopelessness is such a dangerous place, because without hope, we perish in one way or another. With no hope of escape, we begin to die spiritually, we begin to die emotionally, and we may even choose to die physically. Why? because we were made for relationship with God and each other. Refusing to be in relationship can actually be suicidal. Why? Because relationship really is essential to being, to being human, to staying alive, to existing. There is, however, a good story at the end of this which is that we don't have to be alone. We don't have to be completely separated. We don't have to lose our hope or turn to false gods. We can turn to Jesus who is right there and we can be in relationship with Jesus who is life. Um, Romans asks this question, who can save us from the cycle of separation, loneliness, despair, and death? And the answer is, thanks be to God through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Uh, in Jesus, we can see the answer, the antidote to this long cycle of sin, suffering, and death that we can choose to replace with life. Romans 8, 38, 39 
says, For I am convinced that neither death nor life, nor angels nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will ever be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. You see, despite our being separated physically right now because of coronavirus, um, we're not alone. Um, we're still with each other in spirit, and each of us is together um, and separately um, bonded to and in a relationship with Jesus. And that means that there's hope. There is hope for your future and for my future and all of our futures. Because Jesus came to restore a lost and separated people to God. That's us. Uh, Jesus came to restore people to each other and to permanently cure this loneliness that has no cure except in Jesus and in our love and fellowship with each other. And so Jesus came to enable us to be in relationship. How essential really then is relationship? It's so important that the Son of God gave his life to make it possible. Salvation, really, is restoration to relationship. So as hard as this story is, as hard as these separations are, as hard as our life challenges and loneliness is sometimes, there is hope for the future because Jesus is always present and we can always turn to each other, even if we can't be present in person. Um, and we can experience that relationship with each other that really does give us life. So that's what I had for this week. Next week, though, this is not the end of the story. Uh, relationship is essential to being because being leads to something. It leads to becoming. And that's what we're going to talk about next week. Relationship is essential to becoming. So I hope you will come back and join us then. Thanks.